Ladies and gentlemen, we're back with more Podfast Asia, the Metaverse Asia podcast live taping. So we are bringing this footage and broadcast out to LinkedIn and everywhere else. And uh, today I'm super glad and honored because Michael Potts, my next guest, he's the CEO of M2 Studios. Uh, he's entering our stage and uh, he will be uh, riffing and jamming with me about the Metaverse and uh, what the future holds for the Metaverse in terms of building and development. So here's a little bit of intro before I bring him on to our stage. He founded uh, the company M2 Studio uh, in 2000 with the mission of incorporating cutting edge visualization technologies into architecture, engineering, and construction. Business verticals. M2 provides architects, designers, developers, and construction executives with advanced technical and artistic resources that deliver or supplement their in-house immersive marketing and presentation capabilities. So without further ado, let's bring our next guest. How are you, my friend? Good morning. I'm doing well. Morning for you over there. It's uh, late afternoon over here. It's past uh, 5 p.m. in the afternoon. I understand, you know, geniuses work late and uh, you've been up all night uh, working on a project, right? So tell us what you're up to this week. Oh, man, it is exciting. We are working on so many different, really, uh, just, I have to pinch myself. I can't believe how lucky we are to work on all these cool projects. I can't give you all the details, but I can say, I'm working on the planet Arrakis. I think that's enough to give you a little insight right there. Um, but um, across a lot of different industries, uh, you know, uh, military, entertainment, sports, um, you know, business. It's just, it's, I, you know, your introduction talked about architecture, and that's where we were going. But in the last year with the metaverse, it's just gone all different directions. And so we're working on a lot of different areas. This is fantastic, and I think uh, this is a really exciting times, right, uh, for anyone who is in this space. And I got to know you through uh, one of our good friends and one of our former podcast guests on the Metaverse Asia podcast, uh, Jake Steinman. I think he's uh, heading, you know, community uh, at Spatial.io, and uh, he recommended you as someone who could come on and really educate our Asian audience about the world of the Metaverse. So I think uh, let's get cracking uh, with the first question uh, for this afternoon. Tell us, you know, uh, in terms of the metaverse, uh, what the next few years of metaverse building and development will actually look like, in your opinion. Yeah, this is, it's fun. It's funny. You know, just if you go back just a few months ago, maybe five months ago, I think you might hear a little this, a little that about the metaverse. But in the last month, right, the last 30 days, it's, it's the talk of so many different companies. In fact, uh, in the United States, just in the last 48 hours, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook, he's reorganizing the company. He's calling it a metaverse company. He's a, he brought in a new executive team to focus on the metaverse. And so I think a lot of different and a lot of different companies in the United States right now are, you know, getting funded, re raising revenue to start to put a lot of energy and focus on the metaverse, including spatial, including the spatial. And I'm, I work really closely with those guys. I've been working closely with them. Uh, for over a year now, and and I think the thing that we're going to see is there's there's going to be all these different um, we can call them metaverses or metaverse eye or mini miniature metaverses, but this is where the next I think the next year to like four years we're going to see the the sort of establishment of where these various uh, platforms are going to make their sort of their their beachhead and say this is what. These are the kind of clients, these are the type of customers, these are the kind of people who we want to take care of and, and help and promote and give them uh, agency and give them an experience or experiences uh, that they can play with. But I mean, as far as builders, like I, like, I call myself a metaverse architect. I, I've been trained in architecture, but where, as far as builders go, these are the, fun, the funnest days of our careers because we're getting to create uh, and it's just, it's like your creativity and your imagination, it's whatever you come up with, you can start to create it and then bring people in. It's a tons, it's tons of fun. And, and so I think the next two to three years are going to be uh, uh, just a, a roller coaster of fun and excitement and seeing all kinds of new opportunities come along. Yeah, I think before we dive into some of the other questions we have prepared for you, uh, you mentioned about Mark Zuckerberg. I think that definitely stole many headlines around the world, right? When he announced 
uh, you know, their strategy of the turning Facebook into the metaverse company. So I think quotes by Mark Zuckerberg were quite telling about how he sees uh, Facebook's future. And I think folks in tech and business and marketing, they should all start thinking about a metaverse, right? So what does it mean for, for them and their business and brands when it comes to the world of XR, Web3, NFTs and blockchain? Yeah, it's a, it's a big it's a good question. It's a big question because I think it means different things to different companies, right? Like some folks are using they're using the metaverse or the concept of the metaverse right now to engage with their customers, to engage with their fans. Their the celebrities are using the metaverse concept. I mean, we just got through building an experience for a record producer, for a music producer, and we he ha he had us build him an environment of a production facility uh, and, a, and, a, and a this big beautiful home up in the mountains in, in uh, Lord of the Rings kind of kind of the scenery. And he's using it to, to bring people to him to have meetings and parties and gatherings. So that's one use of a celebrity, uh, you know, growing his brand and bringing people in. But then you've got, you've got like defense contractors wanting to use uh, the metaverse to, to, to teach and to uh, inform their customers. And then you've got brands that are into fashion that are wanting to, to promote their, their, new, their new item, their new fashion element, and they can use Metaverse as a showroom. So there's a lot of different ways and from a financial perspective, but then you've just got people who just want to build something fun and have their friends and family come visit them. And so you've got a headset in, in Singapore and he's got a headset in New York, and we can just jump in and see the whole thing together. Yeah. Very well said, my friends. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned about fashion world as well. And uh, I'm also like pretty excited with how, you know, they're entering the metaverse in a huge way. And so many fashion shows are now going uh, digital only and uh, using avatars as models, right? And they're able to render, you know, and create so many meta humans that looked, uh, you know, uh, uh, they're actually dressed up in the kind of digital clothing that are impossible to make in real life and reality, but they're able to now extend that vision and uh, make it come to fruition because of technology. So, you know, we definitely want to discuss more about in terms of like what it is, uh, you know, currently like uh, in this metaverse marketplace as well. So, can you tell us what kind of developments are you seeing that really excites you? Well, okay. And so, you should know my background is in architecture. So, so I tend to kind of approach it a little bit more from the built environment that goes anywhere from uh, a building or a or a uh, a scenery or a park, but then it also can go to like spaceships inside and outside, and it can be you know it can be on the moon or on 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 a mountaintop or under the ocean. But I I don't have quite as much, although I do like to sew and make costumes and stuff for Burning Man. Still, um, my my fashion limit is only so far. So, uh, but what I would say. The, he's mentioned blockchain and the NFT. Like that's the other thing. A lot of the stuff we're doing right now has a connection in one way or the other to blockchain technology, to NFT art, to NFT not just being art, but as a tool for a ticket or an NFT as a process to sell something that you know you want to sell to either a, a very, very, very uh, rare item to only a few people, or you want to sell something at a larger quantity. And, and they're not just using like an Ethereum or, a, or, or a, a, a Bitcoin NFT, but they're using they're using like these different tokens that are much easier to mint, right? The, I'm trying to think of them. Uh, Solana is one. Uh, I, I, I'm drawing a blank, but there's a lot of different different uh, tokens that people are using right now to to, to mint and, and sell these NFTs, and they're using the virtual reality experience and and and, and augmented reality, truthfully, augmented and virtual reality. But they're using that as a platform to display and share and explain what their what their NFT is. And this is the definitely uh, really fantastic. And uh, in terms of how gaming world has already done something similar for years, but they have never, you know, uh, ha have the kind of technology that allows, you know, the uh, players, right, uh, to actually own the digital assets in the game, gaming world. And now with blockchain and what you mentioned, NFTs as well, they get to own this and uh, even make money out of it. So we are seeing a lot of headlines as well this week about Axie Infinity. I think that's a game that is actually developed in this part of the world in Southeast Asia and Vietnam and has caught really, you know, a lot of traction. And we see even, you know, uh, the plights of reality of, poor people in the Philippines or even Vietnam, right? Making a living or quadrupling their income 
by just playing games on it and uh, building digital assets and trading those assets. And I think that's a, a really great way as well for the uh, creator economy or people who are in this uh, play uh, to earn economy, which is uh, loosely also, you know, one of the ways that we can associate uh, with Web3. So maybe tell us, uh, you know, what are the biggest challenges right now uh, for businesses to actually get involved in the metaverse? Well, what, you know, I've been pushing virtual reality for a long time. Like I've been working with virtual reality for 25 years. And uh, even 15 years ago, I had a $100,000 virtual reality headset. Um, I, I might have it right here. Just a second. I need a mic. But um, sure. let me guess. Is that a uh, Vario headset, <laughs> which is super expensive, I understand? It can be an Oculus Quest 2, right? Because Six. I you, can see, yeah. Six. you can see this guy here. This is an right. end game. So this was only twenty five thousand, but when you got the trackers and all the equipment to make it work, it was around a hundred thousand dollars. You see this thing? This this is like the size of like a garden hose, right? That's what you. That's what it took. Okay, twenty five years ago, I started working with virtual reality. The biggest challenge today isn't the hardware. For the last twenty five years, up until October, it was the hardware. It was the equipment. But now. It's, it's, it's more or less this. This is the biggest challenge. Two or three big ones. One, a person had a bad experience two years ago or three years. Just a, an average business guy or lady said, oh, I, I did it two years ago. I don't like it. I hate it. I got sick. I never want to do it again. That happens, right? And so that'll stop development. All it takes is someone high level to say, no, I don't want to do VR because it may. Well, the new virtual reality equipment, it's not, it's not going to do that, Like, especially if you built it right and you've done the right experience. It won't make it nauseous. The other one is there's a lot of demands for it to fit into exactly what we're doing. And what you've got to understand is sometimes you have to approach these th this tool as, okay, it can do this, this, and this really well. But you need to look at how you can use those different features of, of AR or VR for your company and not necessarily – expect the AR or VR to do exactly what you're doing right now. So you have to sometimes kind of go to that technology a little bit and say, okay, now what can this technology do for me? Instead of, I want to do something I'm already doing and I want VR to do it better. Sometimes it will, and sometimes it won't. And I'd say the other challenge is that we're still going to be developing this technology, the hardware for the next, you know, it's going to continue to go. I remember when 2007, I bought eight iPhones for all my employees. And the old iPhone had a tiny little screen and it didn't do that much. It was new technology. But if you look and see how it's advanced in the last 13 years and gotten better and it's more powerful and there's so many more things you can do and all these apps, we're going to see the same type of development with the VR and the AR headsets. They're going to get better and better and better. And I love this, this AR headset called Unreal. And it comes out of China and it's fantastic. I have one here. I don't have yeah, here yeah let's zoom in on you have, you have a chance to use it yet? Have you had a chance to use this? Yes, please show us, yes. Yeah, the Unreal glasses. I mean, here's right. the here's the beautiful thing about these glasses. And they're not perfect. They don't they're not perfect, but they are very good. The optics are great, and you can put them on your head, and it's like a pair of sunglasses, they're a little thicker, but you can carry them around in your pocket. And I wore these on an airplane the other day, and I watched my movie, and it was like a hundred inch TV in the airplane and I can still see when the flight attendant walks by, but now I've got a movie and, and this is actually full AR with the, with mixed reality. So you can display your 3d NFT here on your, at your, at your office or at a, at a sales center or whatever, and you can carry it around and pull it out of your pocket and put it on. So it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. I'm looking at that piece of a, uh, you know, AR glass that you're holding. It, it seems like, you know, Definitely not a refined version that probably, you know, what Apple will be building next. I think probably will look slimmer and uh, probably with better battery life, I think. But I think this beats having a toaster uh, look like the device uh, planted in front of your face. I think I would never be caught in public, right, wearing one of these toaster, you know, yeah. uh, headsets or helmets, like what Mark Zuckerberg like to call it. But I think this is a definitely a, a way more you know uh, advanced and uh, a better better size a better design and it's gonna just improve my leaps and bounds in the next quarter i think within the last three quarters we have already seen amazing advancements right it used to be you know not too long ago when you need to actually get a vr headset to work you need to actually connect a cable to your pc 
And now that's not necessary anymore. I think the Oculus Quest 2, probably, I think it was uh, talked about in many podcasts as well, has actually driven up adoption by, I think, more than a thousand percent because of, uh, you know, the non-requirement to actually connect a cable to the PC. And that really helps people to enter the metaverse, right? And people are spending more time in places like recreation room. Probably the average spend time in recreation room is like three hours. So that's like the lifespan maybe of the battery life uh, when you actually power it up for the first time. And uh, people are spending as much time there as they could as long as their battery life allows them. So I think you brought a great point about hardware uh, you know, challenges. So how about in terms of like technological advances, um, what do you think are needed to see massive adoption and exponential growth? Yeah, well, okay. So one of the challenge, one of the technical challenges right now is that we still don't have the ability to uh, bring in 500 people into the same environment, right? Or a thousand people or 2000 people. There's no platform out there with virtual reality where you can do that. That's one of the only has uh, up to 32, right? At this moment. Spatial's got 32. Uh, they're, they t- I just talked to them last week and they said they're working to, they're going to make that considerably higher in the next few months. Um, the, they're going to do it the way everyone else has kind of figured out, which is the, the solution where we're, we're going to do probably an instancing thing where you won't see all the other people in the space with you, but, they'll, but that you can have all these people. And then one, like your celebrity, let's say you're a movie star or an, uh, a, an athlete, that person can be in, let's say, this virtual environment. And then you can have 500 or 1,000 people joining that, that one star and, or that one athlete or that one guest speaker from the corporate company. Uh, and that's what I think uh, we'll see. The challenge there is that it's not necessarily a hardware or a software. It's network traffic. Network traffic doesn't really want to send all the interconnections that are necessary to have the avatars with their mouths and their hands and their eyes to all the other 500 people in the space, right? That's the challenge is that the mo- as soon as you keep multiplying the number of users, so I don't think that's that's gonna be solved anytime soon. I think it's, a, it's, it's important to understand there are some limitations that are gonna stay here for a while. Now, one of the ones I think we're gonna see that's going to change is when the avatars start to look more and more real and act more and more real, when you are in an environment with someone and you feel like, man, that, even though I know that's not a real person, the, the, the facial interactions, the, 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 the mouth movement, the eye movement, when those things start to come off as much more accurate to their actual, uh, their body or their, their face, I think that's going to make a big difference. It's going to help in the, in the, the, the experience. And I do think that's coming. I believe that Facebook's working on that with the mouth tracker. And I think that these uh, forward thinking, really kind of advanced platforms like Spatial and others are going to get on that and make sure that the avatars look much more realistic and much more, um, you know, not just not just photorealistic, but they're more expressive. And that'll that'll bring the experience to a higher level. And then on top of it, just when you see the hardware get better with terms of performance in the, the processor, it's going to mean the environment can be more. It will mean that the interactions can have more. It'll mean that the the sound and the visuals and all the stuff that bring the experience to, to life and make it exciting will just keep getting higher and higher. And if you look down just a few years, you're going to see that what we're in right now is the early days. We're in the iPhone 1 of the iPhone 2 days, really. Because like you said, it wasn't until the Oculus Quest 2 that we really reached that point where a standalone device made sense. If you go back before that and you said, I want a great uh, wireless solution, you were probably going to get a vibe a Vive Pro with a wireless kit, but you had to have a desktop computer and that whole thing cost you about $4,000. So when the Oculus came out, it went from $4,000 from a great wireless experience to $300. I've bought 60 of these headsets so far and sent them to my clients. This is brilliant. And I think uh, you mentioned about technology, you know, some of these uh, that are emerging. There is one company that I recently came across. I think if I'm not wrong, they are also called Emerge. What it provides is like a MacBook-like uh, tray that you can place in front of your desk mm-hmm. and uh, it's using sound wave to actually simulate feel and a sense that of more present. So if you are entering the metaverse or virtual world with your headset, right, you definitely want to feel that someone is near you. That could actually be achieved by using sound waves effect. Mm-hmm. Just like when you're standing right in front of a huge stage of a Rammstein 
or Iron Maiden concert, for example, and you feel the thumping bass, right? And your heart is pounding at the same time. That kind of uh, you know um, reality can be replicated using this sort of technology, and we are so excited to see so many new startups, you know, bringing new ideas and from ideation to execution. This uh, industry is moving at a really rapid pace, yeah, and it's changing every day with new startups sprouting here and there. So we definitely want to, you know, pick your brains a bit more when it comes to your expertise. I know uh, you create and you design and also, you know, bring a lot of custom environments into spatial. That's what uh, Jake Steinemann uh, actually uh, pitched to me when he suggested you on this show. Um, can you maybe tell us the process? Do you like require like really expensive equipment uh, these days to even do a scan of objects? Or do you really need to create from scratch uh, using, using some tools like maybe uh, Blender or Sketchfab to create objects and import them into the virtual world? Or maybe even an iPhone 12 Pro, for example, that comes with a LiDAR and true depth. That's good enough to actually scan objects and bring them uh, do all these 3D models in the metaverse world. Yeah, you know, I, I was hopeful that the 3D scanner, the LiDAR scanners on the iPhones would, or the new iPads and iPhones would work. I tell people who, who are asking me, like, can I just use this? And here's what I'll tell them, tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the same thing I tell them. The, the issue with the LiDAR scanner is, is that you don't get enough detail where you really want it, and you get a little bit too much detail where you, where you don't. And what I would describe is like if I were to bring that, that stool back there, that white stool, and scan it, I would get a lot of detail over the whole thing, but I wouldn't get the round, smooth, you know, uh, uh, metal uh, base to that thing the way it really is. So I would end up with more geometry than I would really get if I just modeled it from scratch. If I modeled it from scratch, I'd have it perfect, and it would look better, and it would actually be much more optimized. So, and if you scan a big wall with those scanners, you get a lot of extra data. So it's actually, it's actually got to stay for a little while longer, a manual process. I think down the road in three or four years, maybe five, we'll have artificial intelligence systems that'll take those LiDAR scanners and clean them up and get you a file that really works and looks fantastic. But we're not quite there yet. So it's still a manual process. And to answer your question about the, the tools we use, we're a 3D Studio Max company. My business, I've been working with 3D Studio Max since 90, uh, 1997. All my employees know 3D Max, and that's the one. But it, it's very similar to Blender. It's got a little bit more professional tools and tweaking and stuff like that. But Blender is a similar program. You can certainly do almost everything you want to do with Blender, and it's completely free. And then we work. We Clients send us their files. They, they tell us what they want. They just describe it to us, or they will send us drawings, or they'll send us photographs. And, you know, we can take uh, photographs or 360 scans or Matterport or whatever and do digital twins. But a lot of times the stuff that we're doing is it's in your head, right? It's just an imagination where someone's making a description and then we build it. And what's fun and what's cool now is that we start out really rough in virtual reality. And then we take our clients in and say, hey, here's our idea. What do you think? And then they'll walk around and we'll all walk around with them. And they're in different cities. And we're sketching on this design and we're working it out in virtual reality. But the, but the advantage there is that they see it early on and it moves the process along really fast. So instead of something taking months, things can take days or weeks. So it moves the development really quickly. And then they know what they're getting. So then they'll visit us again in a couple of days and a couple of days later. And within a week or two, it looks pretty much ready to go. So you know, talk to us about how we could... For example, if I want to build a custom environment, right, and uh, it has to look like maybe uh, the uh, scenery, you know, when I'm in a pub or a saloon, and uh, I want to actually scan a uh, wine bottle. Yeah, I want to bring a wine bottle to the metaverse world. I want to en enable anyone, you know, to just pick up that bottle and pour drinks and toast each other. So if I want to, like, create a project like that, what kind of cost are we talking about? And will this be a long time consuming process? Before, you know, a client, for example, can actually see these come to life. So the part on the wine bottle, you could probably use the LiDAR scanner if you wanted to or photographs. Although, again, it would be better to have it optimized and built in 3D just because the, it's, anytime, you, anytime you can have a mathematical equation or a, or a mathematical like an algorithm that will produce the geometry, you'll get a cleaner, smoother, uh, more, more, more uh, efficient uh, geometry. But... 
you could definitely use a LiDAR scanner. You could use your phone scanner. You, it, it even got like, you know, photogrammetry models where you just take photographs and then the, the, the application will, will produce it for you. Now, when it comes to the bar, yes, you could do a scan, but you're probably going to get a model that you're not going to love. It's not going to look great. It'll be okay, but it'll be very clunky too. There'll be like jagged edges and missing pieces and stuff like that, but you could still do it. Now, if you went to a company like ours, and there's other companies out there too, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty in in, uh, in uh, Singapore, but if you if you went to a company and said, hey, this is what we want, and we hear our photographs, what we're finding is it takes us about, uh, you know, let's say it takes about 40 to 60 man hours to produce that um, that bar. And, and that's probably from the beginning to the end of the day. Now, maybe if it's a really complicated multi-level, maybe it's going to be more like 100. But basically, something like 40 to 60 hours um, will probably get it to development. And then what, the cool thing is, is once you've got it, not only do you have it and you can use it forever, that same model over and over, you can use that same model in different platforms. So you can put it in spatial. But let's say you also want to put it in alt space or you want to put it in another platform. You can do that. And the other thing is, is that, and Spatial is really cool with this, you can make multiple copies of it. So you can have like one version for, you know, that you decorate it this way and another version where you just show off this brand. Like, let's say we're just going to have Asahi beer on this one. And then this one over here, we're going to have Budweiser. You could do those kinds of things. So you get to re leverage once you've created the bar, once you've created the scene, you get to leverage it and use it again and again, but you can use it in different ways. Change the music out, right? Like, this one's got hip hop, this one's got heavy metal, and this one over here's got country. And you've got three bars, three different, three different types of music, three different types of graphics, three different types of be beverage. This is fantastic. Since we're on the topic of 3D model building, design, and importing them into this uh, metaverse world, right? Let's talk about some of the wildest or craziest uh, ideas that your clients bring to you and yet you have actually you know, built for them. Can you maybe uh, tell us like three examples of really wild things that you have built for them so far? Yeah, um, so you know, and you, when you mentioned bar, we we actually have done, I think at this point, probably, uh, man, I think we've done like eight or nine bars already. You know, that's just, that's one of the things we get asked to do from time to time, including Jake who asked us to do the most Eisley bar from Star Wars, which, which, which one of my employees did. Uh, well, my, my number one guy, Brian, he did the, the, the bar from Star Wars. So that would be one of the more outrageous things we've done. Um, you know, it is really across the board. Like we did a farm. So we have someone asked us to build a farm. So we did a farm in virtual reality. Um, I built an underwater base. And like I said, I'm building right now. We're building like planets to where you go to the surface of a planet. You look around and you're on another planet with sound effects and music and vegetation and the sky and moons and all that stuff. So that's kind of fun to just be able to go in that direction. And then the other thing that's happening, and it's, it's trust me, this is where we're going to go with this. And, it, and it's happening right now. Like we're just in the early stages of development. It's not just a space. It's an, it's an experience. It might be almost like a ride, right? So it might be like you get into this virtual reality experience and you're standing there and all of a sudden the door closes and your vehicle like takes off into the air and goes into outer space. And now you're riding this spaceship with your friends to uh, the moon or to Mars or to another planet. And th to turn it into an experience like that gives you all this, all these new cool things you can do because you can take it futuristic and have holographic, you know, uh, controls and you can see uh, other spaceships and things explode and stuff like that. So that that's where we're going to go is it's and not just a, a, a model or an environment, but an experience. This is amazing. And you know, my dream <laughs> is to actually hold a uh, podcast festival in the desert. And I think, you know, with the pandemic, making it, uh, you know, less and less likely for me to pull something like that off, I think a virtual festival uh, in the metaverse where we can actually do podcasting and invite uh, thousands of podcasters around the world to congregate in a virtual space and then do podcasting uh, festival. I think that will be probably something that's more feasible and achievable. I know that when I will actually come around to executing this uh, idea of mine, I'll come to you, my friend, to help us to build out this custom environment and virtual world. Before we let you go, I want to ask you one last question. I think this is also an important question. Do you think that realistically, uh, will it be one mega metaverse or will it be a bunch of walled off miniverses? Yeah. 
uh, and this is a question that's being asked right now. When you see Facebook say they're going to put, they're, they're going to turn their company into um, uh, the metaverse company, and then you see companies like Epic uh, putting a bi billions of dollars towards this goal. And, and, then, and then at the level of spatial, and there's a few other companies out there engaged, and, and, and maybe uh, Altspace and a few others, that they're trying to be the the uh, the metaverse, or not the metaverse, but one of the or a a version of a metaverse. And then there's even some second or some third tier companies that are younger or less established, and they see the goal of being that. The thing is, it's a race. It's a race right now, and and I don't know. I don't believe it's going to be like the Ready Player One. I don't think it's going to be like that. There was a smart, a little tiny part of that scene where in, in, in the movie, the Ready Player One in the book, where he talks about how there were these kind of these kind of uh, broken up areas. Like this is for gamers, and this is for this is for gambling, and this is for education, and this is for extreme sports. And I think we'll probably see something like that. But I don't know that that's going to stay. I don't think that'll be connected all together for a really long time. Like as far as like you can go to one place and you can just go into. I think that's going to be a while before you can just go to any one place from one single metaverse. Instead, I think it is going to be more like uh, one company will try to will, will try to establish itself as the company for extreme sports, and one company will be the metaverse for um, augmented reality AR uh, games, and one will be the metaverse for uh, the, the like a second tier or the second like layover of the entire Earth. Like there's a company called Superworld that is uh, trying to build a platform that has essentially every square foot of Earth will be covered with an augmented reality layer. And if they're successful, that could, that could really be impressive. But I do think that we're going to see, um, you know, a business kind of metaverse and a gaming metaverse and one that kids want to be in and one that adults want to be in and one that you know, adults want to be in. But I don't necessarily think that all the adults want to go where all the kids are. And I don't know that they're all going to be in virtual reality. Some of these metaverses may be usually used on a PC and not necessarily with glasses. And some of these are going to be so much better with, I always tell people, like, if you can get into the environment with VR, trust me, the experience is going to be so much better than if you do it on a PC. But not everybody has VR and not everybody wants to do VR. But if you do, once you get in there, it tends you tend to get hooked. So once you start in virtual reality, you say, Okay, this is the real way to experience this. I get hooked, but I do. I think you know, um, uh, VR chat, uh, alt space, spatial, engage. Um, you know, there's a lot of these companies out there that are making a, a good attempt, and I think some of them are going to be successful. But I don't know for sure exactly which ones. I love spatial. The platform has been uh, just constantly getting better and better and better, and they are just shooting for the moon. And I think they're going to be one of the most incredible VR companies as the as, and AR companies as the years go by, but there's a lot of there's a lot of companies that are going for that as well. I promise this will be the last last question, my friends. So because we are talking about companies, right? So will it be Facebook dominating again, or would it be more likely Epic Games? The the advantage that Facebook has is that they have the hardware, and because they have the hardware, they kind of get to control. Uh, what what's gonna what's gonna be on your face, right? What's gonna come to your eyes? I I was a beta tester for the Horizons, and I'm personally not. I mean, I like their headset, but I didn't find Horizons to match the needs uh, of what I want. And I want to create, right? And I want to create high quality, high end experiences. And and I thought Horizons was kind of fun. It was kind of cute for kids. But I don't think that's if if, if I'm a brand, if I'm like um, if I'm Gucci or I'm Ford, or if I'm a major corporation and I'm looking to build an experience that's going to you know, impress my, my, my shareholders, my clients, my customers, if I'm going to go out there and try to really put my best foot forward, I want a platform that I can really do that on. And honestly, this isn't, this isn't Epic Games right now, and it's not Facebook. It's these, other, it's these other companies that have been more targeted towards businesses. It's the spatials. It's the other companies like that that, are, that, are, that, have, a, that have a platform that's better suited for that. But, we, but you know, those companies don't have <laughs> tens of billions of dollars either or hundreds of billions of dollars. So I think Facebook is going to make a really uh, – if, if, 
if Facebook tweaks their platform, if Facebook goes after a different platform or acquires another platform, if Facebook can create the platform to work, and if they can back off a little bit, because I think there's people kind of like Facebook, they, they already have a sort of a hesitation. I hear a lot of businesses say that. I don't want to use, I don't want to be forced to use a Facebook account to, to get into this thing. And I understand why Facebook wants it. And I also understand why businesses don't want it. It's it's a it's a bit of a problem, but if Facebook can back off of that a little bit and find the sort of sweet spot where they're not going to make their business customers go, I don't want to get a bis- I don't want to get a Facebook account. And if they change their platform from something that looks like Horizons to something that looks like, I want to go into that Gucci store, I want to go into that Ford store, and I want to look at my my brand new you know 2025 Ford Bronco, and I want to choose the options, and I want the salesman to come out here. And tell me what I'm going to, all the cool things, and I want to press a button and I want it to be delivered to me. That's not going to happen on Facebook Horizons. That's not going to happen on an Epic Games. But if that could happen on another platform or if a platform comes along, those are the kind of things that I think we'll see uh, a lot of a lot of interest from consumers, corporations, and and all the way through. So I, I would say I give an edge to Facebook over over Epic, but I, but it's not to say Epic couldn't do it. I just think I think owning the hardware that's going to be on your on your face it gives them a, a, a big leg up. Yeah, I think I'm 100% aligned uh, with uh, your opinion as well uh, in terms of the advantage, in terms of the resources, and also the fact that they've been speaking really loudly about this uh, this week. I think Boss uh, was talking on another podcast. I think uh, he has been. Uh, really doing a lot of work with uh, his uh, Facebook Reality Labs, right, which is really central to the metaverse, and they are kind of like standing up uh, a metaverse product uh, group uh, under his organization, and uh, to bring together, you know, all these teams uh, focus on responsibly building this ambitious work. So I think the key word is responsibly because we know Facebook doesn't has have a great record in terms of their wall garden and with their closed social graphs. So Epic yeah. Games, uh, you know, have actually led the way in terms of like getting so many other companies like Microsoft, Sony on board, and even, you know, pushing all this cross-platform and pushing even Apple to open it. So I think it's great to have competition and we definitely don't want to just see one company dominating. We want to see the small, you know, interesting, innovative companies, uh, you know, succeed as well. So the next uh, few quarters is definitely going to be really exciting times for those who are working in this industry. So um, with that, you know, I'm so sorry we dragged on a little bit and uh, almost uh, hitting 40 second minute mark. Thanks for staying up late, Michael. I super appreciate you. And I'm going to make sure that next time when we invite you to our other shows, uh, we'll fit your timing instead. And I will be the one, you know, waking up at no, five. No, no. Hey, listen, I think it's totally fair. I think it's totally fair. I should, I should adjust to your schedule. I totally think that's fair. I think it's fine. It was great talking thank to you, today. you, man. So thank you so much. Really, thank you. And uh, I look forward to, to see you really soon uh, in real life, hopefully, uh, uh, when we get a chance uh, to cover some metaverse uh, or NFT events around the world. And if you happen to be there as well, we definitely want to do a sit-down interview with you the next time. So please take care. Any last words or message for our listeners who are replaying this podcast on their AirPods or smart speakers later on? Uh, just tell them this is a fun time. Get into it if you're thinking about if you're thinking about dipping your toe in this technology. This is the time because these are the these are the fun days, really. Thank you, my friend. I'll see you really soon. Please take care. Take care of yourself over there. Yeah. Goodbye. We'll you, too. you too. See you later. Bye bye. Cheers. That's Michael Potts, Metaverse Architect and CEO of M2 Studio. We have a lots of other program coming up. Uh, not just under the podcast Asia moniker, because uh, we have exciting new shows. Uh, there's one that's uh, going to be titled Engine Starter Saloon that's coming up, which I'm really excited about. So stay tuned for that. More information on our social pages to give us a follow and uh, we'll push out links as soon as we get them. So with that, I'm going to end my broadcast here. I'll be back uh, with uh, Buckley's Band Podcast tomorrow when I speak to my good friend who's a musician and he just launched a new single and probably we'll talk a little bit about NFT, but more focus on his uh, music career so far and uh, why Weezer inspired him uh, to come up with a new song that has to do with humans. So that's uh, some of our other shows that are coming up uh, after this. So stay tuned and uh, I'm going to grab dinner and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.